Hello, and welcome to today's program, The Benefits and Cost Effectiveness of SGLT2 Inhibitors in Type 2 Diabetes Care. My name is Susan Cornell, and I'm going to be serving today as your faculty for this program. My background, I am Associate Director of Experiential Education, Associate Professor of Pharmacy Practice at Midwestern University, and I've also been a certified diabetes educator for many, many, many years, more years than I'm willing to tell anyone, because then you would realize how old I am. Uh, I've been around a long time to see all of the phenomenal changes in diabetes, and we're going to talk about that today because, you know, there's a lot of changes that are currently going on and are coming down the pipeline. My practice is actually at the Bolingbrook Christian Health Clinic in Bolingbrook, Illinois, where I do work with an interprofessional team of healthcare providers in order to provide optimal diabetes care to patients in need. So today's program information, and bear with me as I kind of read through this so everybody's familiar with the, the logistics and we are staying compliant with everything we need to do. So again, program information, today's program is approved for one CME, CNE, CPE, or AAPA credit. Uh, you can download the PDF of the presentation under the Event Resources tab on the left side of your screen under the headshot. If you have a question throughout the program, please type it in the box located in the lower left of your screen. All questions will be answered at the last 10 minutes of the presentation. You will be redirected back to the landing page after the webinar to complete the post-test and the evaluation. You can download or print your certificate. The program is approved by the North American Center for Continuing Medical Education, LLC, an, HA, an HMP company. And finally, this program is supported by an educational grant from Merck. Okay, so let's dive into this. Uh, here's today's learning objectives. For those of you who've ever heard me present before, as you know, I'm not one to sit here and read the slides to you. Uh, I'm here more to talk about key concepts that we need to know when we're managing our people with diabetes. So again, our learning objectives today, you know, we're going to be talking about type 2 diabetes, the role of the SGLT2 inhibitors, and then uh, strategic ways to use to best use these new, or I shouldn't say new, but these particular agents. So with that, if we think about it, you know, diabetes has been around obviously since the beginning of time, and it hasn't even been 100 years yet since the invention of insulin or the availability of insulin. So really, you know, if you think about it, in the last 100 years, we've come a really long way from having one agent available to now having 12 different therapeutic classes of drugs available to treat type 2 diabetes. Yet, despite all of this great science, technology, and medication, we're still seeing an increase in the cases of diabetes. And, you know, currently we have close to 30 million here in the U.S., but that's expected to climb. And probably more importantly is the people with prediabetes. You know, there's over 85 million people that are diagnosed with prediabetes or walking around with it, and many people even have full-blown type 2 diabetes and don't even know it. So part of the problem that we have is that we're, you know, too far along in the disease by the time it's diagnosed, and then we're having to play catch-up. Now, interestingly, on a good note, we are living longer. You know, the life expectancy is growing. People, the baby boomers are, you know, entering retirement and aging. And as we get older, you know, we're living longer, but we want to live a quality, healthy life. And so we're seeing more and more people over the age of 65 that are diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. The other thing, too, is we see an increase in children with diabetes. You know, currently I can tell you I'm, I'm working with patients that children that have type 2, and interestingly enough, we're starting to see more and more older adults that are developing type 1 or type 1 and a half, you know, latent autoimmune onset. So that's a different lecture for a different time, but bottom line is diabetes is rampant and we need to make sure, one, we're diagnosing the correct diabetes and then treating it appropriately because the cost of this is, you know, over $300 billion. And that cost to the patient, indirect and direct costs, as well as the healthcare system, other than that being stifling, 
the fact of the quality of life for our people with diabetes. You know, again, we've come around over 100 years ago. It's not the death sentence it was many years ago, a, you know, a century ago. But today, we want our people to have a good quality of life and live well with diabetes. So if you look at kind of what's going on, what's part of the problem, I mean, we all know this. You know, unfortunately, as a country, we're, we're getting large and fluffy. You know, we're gaining weight, especially in the midsection, adipose tissue. The other thing is we're eating more, exercising less, and we all have increased stress in our life. So all of this leads to insulin resistance. And you know, that's the big point here. You know, again, different lecture for a different time, but no matter what type of diabetes you have, be it type 1 or type 2, people can have insulin resistance. So you know, primarily you see it in type 2, but it is not unheard of to have people with type 1 that have insulin resistance. And that's very important as we move forward and look at treatment strategies. Now, looking, again, 12 classes of drugs, we have technology that is absolutely phenomenal these days, insulin pumps, continuous glucose monitors, uh, you know, phones that have apps that can remind us for adherence or how much insulin we have on board and things like that. So we have this great science and technology, yet only about half of our people with diabetes are meeting their A1C goal of less than seven. Now, I know A1C goal of less than seven is not for everyone. It's for most people with diabetes. Obviously, if you have newly diagnosed and very good support system and motivation, you might go for an A1C goal of less than 6.5. You have maybe someone else who's not as motivated, has had diabetes for a long time, doesn't have a good support system, a higher A1C of less than 7.5 might be appropriate. So setting the, the appropriate target for the patient is important, but no matter what, again, an A1C of less than 7 for most of our folks is not being met. And we have to start looking beyond glycemic control. And this is where diabetes is now going. You know, if you think about it, there is no such thing as a person with just diabetes. And that is really important, so I'm going to say it one more time. There is no such thing as a person with just diabetes. Diabetes goes hand in hand with cardiovascular disease, micro macrovascular complications, a whole plethora of other conditions, depending on if it's type 1 or type 2. You know, type 1, you've got all these other autoimmune conditions to consider. Type 2, again, the cardiovascular component, which is huge. And the problem with type 2 is it takes about 9 to 12 years to actually diagnose. You know, think about it. A person doesn't wake up one day and say, hey, I don't feel good today. I think I have diabetes. That's not what happens. They wake up and they're peeing more often. They have a urinary tract infection. They have a wound that won't heal. They have blurry vision. Or they have a heart attack or a stroke. And so they seek help. And they're found, oh, yes, you have diabetes. You have type 2 diabetes because, again, it takes about nine years for hyperglycemia to be around in order for us to actually diagnose type 2 diabetes. So with that being said, by the time the person's diagnosed, they've already had complications. They have at least, you know, 50, 50 to 60 percent of people have complications at the time of diagnosis. And, again, it could be microvascular. It could be macrovascular. So that's why once the person is diagnosed with type 2, treatment is so critical and so important. Now, I know many of you are going, what the heck, what is she talking about? Nine years to diagnose type 2? What, how did that happen? And part of the reason of that is because we're always looking, or we were always looking at the fasting glucose. The fasting is the last to go up in type 2. Most people with type 2 have an elevated postprandial glucose first. And after nine years of your pancreas in overdrive, working 24 hours a day, seven days a week, the pancreas just says, hey, I'm done. I need a vacation. And that's when the fasting kicks up. Now, simply stated, if you think about it, fasting glucose 
is the last thing to go up. Postprandial is the first thing to go up, which is part of the reason why we see macrovascular complications earlier on in the, in the cascade of events and microvascular complications later. And I'm going to come back to that because I think it's important for us to realize that in addition to this, uh, the fact that, again, postprandial is elevated, we're also starting to see a beta cell decline as soon as the postprandial is elevated. And so here from Dr. Ralph DeFranzo at the Texas Diabetes Institute, who's done you know, a ton of work around uh, diabetes, and I will tell you, he's, I call him the godfather of diabetes because, you know, he's an endocrinologist who's really um, in the forefront of, of this condition and this disease. And he's actually done work where he showed that, again, at impaired glucose tolerance, you're starting to already see 65% beta cell loss. So by the time the person is actually truly diagnosed, you have 80% of beta cell loss in the pancreas. Now, Going back to, again, when we're looking at our person with diabetes, fasting is directly linked to microvascular complications, and postprandial is directly linked to macrovascular. So what does this mean to you? And when I'm working with my people with diabetes, and I tell them, when you test your sugar in the morning, and that morning sugar is above whatever your goal is, because, again, we're individualizing goals here, but again, you know, with the average goal of between 80 and 130 for fasting, anytime your fasting sugar is above that, that's telling you when your risk of eye problems, kidney problems, nerve problems is happening. If you look at your two-hour postprandial, and that's above your target, and again, be it 180 or 140, depending on which guidelines you're using, Anytime your postprandial is elevated, that's telling you when your heart attack or stroke is coming. Fasting is linked to microvascular. Postprandial is linked to macrovascular. So that's very important. And together, the microvascular, macrovascular, the fasting, postprandial together, that's what makes up the A1C. So again, when we're looking at A1C, it's really a three-month average, and seriously, it's really a 30-day average. So that's part of the reason why the A1C by itself doesn't give us all of the information we need. Now, moving on. In type 2 diabetes, what we know is there are at least eight dysfunctional organs or defects in the body. And these eight dysfunctional defects lead to type 2 diabetes. Again, they increase hypoglycemia, and that's what leads to it. So again, we have the alpha and the beta cell in the pancreas. We have the liver, we have the GI tract, the brain, the kidney, the muscle, and my personal favorite, belly fat or adipose tissue. So again, these are the defects that not only lead to beta cell dysfunction, hyperglycemia, but also to insulin resistance. But when we're starting to look at what treatment options are available, we have to realize, again, eight broken organs, but there is no one drug therapy that fixes all eight broken organs. And that's why, again, combination therapy, especially early on, is something that is beginning in popularity, and even the guidelines are supporting that. So we have to start treating this to fix those eight broken organs. You know, it's kind of like if you take your car in and there's eight things wrong with it and they fix one, you still got seven things wrong with the car. So bottom line is, again, we need to look at fixing all of the eight defects. Now, I 100% support the fact that lifestyle can fix some of the defects. And medication therapy as an adjunct to lifestyle is how we can fix those defects. But moving forward, and, you know, I'm fortunate that I've, I've worked with a lot of people and um, I'm privy to, to hearing some information coming with the guidelines that are coming out for the new year, we're going to see some big changes, folks. I will tell you that. There are big changes coming down the pipeline on how we approach our treatment management. And looking, again, at this complementary synergistic effects of therapy, but looking beyond A1C and beyond glycemic measures. So what is the weight effect? What is the hypoglycemic risk? Because hypoglycemia is cardiovascular risk factor. How about risk to the kidneys? So these are things that we have to start looking above and beyond glycemic control 
and actually working with our patients. Because once again, there is no such thing as a person with just diabetes. So now what I'm going to do, I'm going to actually pause for 31 seconds, and I'm going to let you process the information that we just talked about. Uh, the purpose of doing this, you know, we often go listen to webinars or sit in a session. We're like, wow, that was really great. But then you walk away and an hour from now somebody says, oh, well, what was so interesting? And you sit there and you go, uh, I don't want that to happen. So what I want to do is I want you to be able to put something we just talked about into your long-term memory. So I'm going to ask everybody who's listening to take 31 seconds and write down what is something that resonated with you. So go ahead. Okay, so let's regroup. I know I cut off a few seconds, but you'll get them back at the end. So now that we've talked about the fact that you know, we have these eight broken organs and we need to use medications to fix those broken organs and we need to think beyond glycemic measures alone, what is the guidelines? What does you know, the ADA say? And we're all familiar with the ADA guideline that came out um, at the end of 2018. Uh, and is about to be obsolete within probably about 60 days with the new guidelines replacing it. But we'll, we'll currently work on this for the time being. Um, so, you know, the way they look at it is currently, at least for 60 more days or so, metformin is going to still be our first-line therapy. But then what comes after metformin? <clears throat> and that's where it gets interesting. Because the first question you have to do it, or ask yourself is, does your patient have atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease? Do they have ASCVD? Have they had an event? If the answer is yes, then we go with SGLT2s or GLP1s. If the answer is no, then our choice becomes, okay, well, what do you want to work on? Do you want to reduce weight? Do you want to minimize hypoglycemia? Or is cost an issue? And if you look across the board, obviously, you know, we're looking at different things to help get the right drug into the patient's hands. Now, with that being said, let's talk about that, because does the patient have ASCVD? Have they had an event? And let's look at the studies and the drugs that are available. And if you think about it, before 2008, we had no idea. And it wasn't until the cardiovascular outcome trials started to come out and continue to come out that now we have proof of which medications or which classes of drugs really have an influence and which ones don't. And so if you look here at the older drugs, you know, again, metformin, you know, metformin is a good drug, but we don't have cardiovascular data on it. It fixes the liver, and that's about it. So you're fixing one out of eight broken organs. Um, with that said, there is, you know, some benefit <clears throat> to the microbiome, to the gut microbiome. So metformin does have a place, but is first line correct for it, or at least first line by itself? And again, uh, in 60 days to 90 days, we will have that answer, and I think folks are going to be surprised. But moving forward, as we look into the newer drugs, we have a plethora of evidence-based medicine supporting the cardiovascular safety of these newer agents. You know, I've, I've said for years, if a sulfonylurea had to come to market today and go through the CBOTs, it'd never make it to market. But again, back in the 60s and 70s and 80s when all we had was sulfonylureas and that was the only oral agent other than insulin that was available for diabetes, it was a great drug. Today, not so much. Today we have other agents that really target the defects and, again, help beyond glycemic control. Now, specifically, I know we're here to talk about SGLT2s today, so I don't want to get off on a uh, you know, tangent on that, but let's talk about the SGLT2s. And we have data from the CANVAS and the EMPA-REG trials where we show the cardiovascular benefit. So, you know, in terms of the MACE outcomes, Clearly, SGLT2 inhibitors 
have dominated and shown a real difference. Not only reducing uh, cardiovascular death, uh, non-fatal MIs, non-fatal stroke, heart failure, reducing hospitalization or death because of heart failure, all-cause mortality, and then here's the new thing that we're starting to see more and more of now is the renal composite. So we're starting to see the renal benefits. So again, looking beyond glycemic measures to not only cardiovascular, but also renal. And as you can see here from Empareg and Canvas, SGLT2 definitely made a difference. Now, in terms of events, you know, cardiovascular events, we see a benefit there from all three classes of, uh, or all three drugs within the SGLT2 class that have data. So I know there's four classes of drugs, or four drugs within the class, but only three of them have data. The fourth drug, uh, ertagliflozin, the data is coming, but we don't have it yet. So here from Empareg, Canvas, Declare Timmy, we can actually see the uh, SGLT2 inhibitors and the benefits that they have in cardiovascular function. Now, I've already alluded to renal function and stage renal disease. And so here you can see, looking at different EGFRs, how the SGLT2 inhibitors are doing. And even at an EGFR of less than 60, there is benefit to an SGLT2 inhibitor. And then heart failure. That's a big one. So many people with diabetes, specifically type 2, have heart failure. That's one of the big hospitalizations. That's one of the big reasons for death. And now we have a drug that really can tackle it. So again, looking at the benefit of an SGLT2 inhibitor and reducing heart failure, hospitalization, and overall effects. So let's now talk Oh, we talked about this SGLT2 inhibitors. They work beyond glycemic measures, but let's get into them. So I'm going to start out with kind of the mechanism of action. What's going on with this? As we all know, and I've got to take everybody back to the day of pathophysiology, you know, think back to your college days and school days. So in terms of normal renal function, a couple things happen. Obviously, you know, the sugar going through the renal system is reabsorbed in the proximal, tum proxy, I can say this, proximal tubular. So what happens is as we start to increase our levels of sugar in the body, you know, sugar is being cleared, but sometimes it doesn't get reabsorbed. So again, going back to physiology, for most people, our renal threshold is 180. And it's at that point when the sugar reaches 180, milligrams per deciliter in the bloodstream, it starts to spill and not get reabsorbed in the kidney. So in the kidney, in the proximal tubule, we know that we have SGLT2 inhibitors and SGLT1. 90% of these receptors in the kidney are SGLT2 and 10% SGLT1. I'm going to ask you to remember that because it's very important as we move on. Now, if we inhibit this, if we inhibit the body's ability, the kidney's ability to reabsorb glucose, we're going to pee it out. So true, obviously, you know, our, your body does it naturally once it hits 180 or higher, but if we lower that renal threshold, then we can get rid of excess sugar earlier on. So if you think about it, looking at Again, people with type 2 diabetes, and I know Ralph DeFranzo has done some studies on this as well, it's actually estimated that a person with an A1C of 6.5, their renal threshold is already increased to 205. And a person with an A1C of 9, their renal threshold has increased to 265. So once you have diabetes or longstanding hyperglycemia, as well as aging, that renal threshold goes up. So if we could bring it back to normal or a little bit below normal, we will get rid of that extra glucose by peeing it out. Now, I know people are talking, well, can it go too low? Are you going to hypo? No, that's the best thing about this drug. You can't go too low. It has a very low hypo risk when used in monotherapy or when combined with drugs that do not directly affect the pancreas.
So anything but sulfonylureas or insulin. So that's the benefit. Now, I asked you to remember 80 or 90% of SGLT2 is in the kidneys and 10% of SGLT1 is in the kidneys. That flips when you look at the GI tract because obviously there are receptors all over the body. So if we look in the GI tract, we have more SGLT1 receptors in the gut and less SGLT2 in the gut. So one of the things with the SGLT2 class is you do get mostly SGLT2 inhibition in the kidney, but it may have an effect on the gut as well because, again, there are SGLT2 receptors in the gut. And so why is that important? Well, as you can see, SGLT1 is a high affinity, low capacity transporter, where SGLT2 is a low affinity, high capacity co-transporter. So again, hopefully that makes sense to people. Now let's take a look at the algorithm again, you know, the guidelines, the treatment guidelines that we have for at least a few more months that are going to change, especially by the first of the year. But again, currently metformin first line, not going to be there for long, but now we're going to look at SGLT2s. And they're across the board because of the fact not only do they help with ASCVD, they help with reducing heart failure, chronic kidney disease, they have weight loss benefit, low hypoglycemic risk. So really, they're in every single category we can use for choosing as an optimal agent. And now looking here, you can kind of compare not only the dose, but actually the A1C lowering ability, and then of course the, the cardiovascular trials that are either finished, currently going on, uh, should be finished soon, and then looking at their current renal dosing. Again, things may change as the Credence trial comes out uh, and is published. So let's take a look. Great drug, sounds wonderful. There's no such thing as a drug that has no side effects. Now, this one, of course, if you think about it, if you are peeing more sugar, you're going to have more sugar go through the urinary tract, which common sense will tell us because sugar and bacteria are our best friends, you're going to have probably some infections. So urinary tract infections are very, very common in use with these agents. The other thing, too, is if you are, again, peeing out more sugar, sugar and water travel together, so you're losing water. We're volume depleting. Anytime you have a patient who is losing water as well as sugar, one, they're losing calories, and it's actually estimated that the average person loses about three to 400 calories per day on these agents because that's how much sugar you're actually peeing out. But then you can have dehydration. If you're taking a diuretic or any other drug that has a volume depletion issue, you could potentially have very severe dehydration. So obviously with that, you're going to get increased thirst, increased urination, but then you could also increase the infection. So these are things to look at. I will tell you, we spend an awful lot of time educating patients on the side effects of these drugs and methods and strategies to minimizing it. So from when is the best time of day to take this to make sure they're taking and drinking water? You know, I don't say fluids because I work with a lot of people who believe coffee or beer are fluids. Not saying they're not, but they're dehydrating fluids. So you do that, again, dehydration is the issue. We spend a lot of time, especially with our women and men that maybe have a history of urinary tract infections or some of our folks that are overweight where there's a lot of folds down below. And we spend a lot of time talking about hygiene, you know, cleaning. It's very important because, again, we want to make sure that we're reducing the risk of not only the urinary tract infections, uh, but also, again, of the dehydration. So hopefully that makes sense to folks. Now, with that being said, you know, again, we've already talked hypoglycemia is a low risk unless you have a secretagogue on board. Uh, infections, very common, urinary tract, uh, genital infections, so these are something we have to educate our patients on. The other thing, too, is DKA, diabetic ketoacidosis. You can actually see this at what we would consider lower levels of sugar than in years past. 
So watching for that. Is the patient getting nausea, vomiting, diarrhea? You know, are those things happening? And then monitoring. Again, education is the key for this. Now, what I can tell you is, you know, there have been some reports of an increased risk, risk of fracture or amputation, specifically affiliated with canagliflozin. With that being said, uh, reports may be altered once the CREDENCE trial is actually reported because, again, we're starting to see some uh, new information come to light. But currently, for the time being, we want to keep an eye on that, um, although I do believe that is going to change in the near future. So speaking of ongoing trials, we can see here, uh, I know CREDENCE is wrapping up early because of the fabulous reports that we're hearing, but we have CANVAS, we have the EMPA reg, we have DECLARE TIMI, which are again not only talking about the benefits of the cardiovascular issues, but we're starting to look at those renal issues and the reduced in albuminuria as well as use in people with EGFRs less than 60. So again, I think you're going to see a lot of stuff coming down the pipeline in addition to that A1C. So for all of you here who want to know, well, what's the A1C, we have plenty of data on that, but it's not just about the A1C. Reduced blood pressure. You know, we're starting to see that the people that are taking SGLT2 inhibitors have better blood pressure. And this is what is leading to potentially, again, improvement in heart failure, weight loss, um, a reduction in oxidative stress, et cetera. So again, there's more to these drugs than just lowering the A1C. So these are things we need to start looking at moving forward above and beyond that control. Now, again, for the time being, with metformin being currently first-line therapy, metformin and an SGLT2 combination are a great combo. They work synergistically, works well. Um, good for lowering fasting as well as postprandial. Metformin lowers fasting, SGLT2 inhibitors lower both. So they're kind of available for anything. Now, we also are starting to see a lot of use with non-metformin combination therapy. I will tell you one of the biggest ones that is being used out there are the DPP4 SGLT2. And those are fabulous for lowering, lowering postprandial because the DPP4s don't have a lot of oomph to them. You know, they only target postprandial, and anytime you target postprandial, you're not getting a great A1C lowering. When you target fasting, now you get more of a heroic lowering of the A1C. So in this particular case, yes, the combo of DPP4, SGLT2 are good, but that's not something you want to be using in a person with a very high A1C. If you're looking for fasting lowering, that's where you want to start to look at GLP-1s in combination with SGLT2 inhibitors. So again, combination therapy really helps us to fix as close to all eight broken organs as possible. You know, there is no perfect combination that fixes all eight, but we can get gosh darn close to seven, seven and a half maybe, uh, and then you combine that with lifestyle and it makes a huge difference. So what I'm going to do is one more time, I'm going to pause, but this time I'm only pausing for 27 seconds. I want you to kind of digest the information that we've talked about and what's something that resonated with you. So go ahead and take 27 seconds and write down something that you found interesting. Okay, so let's regroup. Um, also, if you had a chance in these digestion breaks, as I like to call them, uh, feel free to type something into the question and answer box, and we will definitely get to it at the end of today's program. So again, purpose of the digestion breaks is to put it into your long-term memory, to process what you've had, and then actually maybe write it down using different learning techniques so that a week or two from now when somebody says, oh, what was something interesting about that webinar, you actually have an answer. So again, it's for memory, retention, and recall. So the last thing that I want to wrap up with is we have all these great trials. You know, we have EMPA-REG, which really uh, 
set the SGLT2 inhibitors on a trajectory for being a phenomenal class of drugs. Then we have Canvas that came in as well. We have Declare. And up and coming, we've got uh, Credence coming as well. So there's so many of these trials going on. But, you know, if we think about it, it's a small percentage of people that actually live in the clinical trial world. Most people live in the real world. I will tell you, most of my patients, uh, we struggle to make sure that they just take their medication, uh, that they can afford it, that, uh, you know, there are, there are not other issues interfering with their daily life that will prohibit them from being adherent. So we have to look at the real world. You know, real world people don't actually match what folks in clinical trials are really doing, and there is a difference with that. You know, there's a lot of data out there also about clinical inertia. Um, Koontz in, I believe, 2013 had published a very in interesting report, and it was found that even though the patient's A1C was over 8.7, and they were on one drug, monotherapy and one drug for, with an A1C of over 8.7, it took 2.2 years for another agent to be added. That's unacceptable. In today's day and age, why are we waiting? Even more interesting, he found that people that were on two oral agents, it took over seven years, despite an A1C over nine, before a third agent was added. If you think about it, again, eight broken organs. There is no one drug therapy that fixes all eight. Why are we waiting to treat the patient to fix all eight broken organs, why are we waiting till the drug fails and then add something? We're allowing the disease to progress. And so clinical inertia is one of our biggest problems. And again, getting the patient to understand and the patient education. You know, oftentimes, and I hear this all the time, my patient will come in, I'll say, you know, I think we need to add another medication. Oh, oh, but Dr. Cornell, I, you know what, we had parties this week and it was the holidays and, and I know my sugar is up. I'll do better next time. It's not about that. You know, we can try a medication addition and then see how it goes and as the patient improves and their lifestyle gets better, we could take away, we could de-prescribe. And so giving the patient that hope that just because we're starting a new drug and then again explaining about fixing all eight of the broken organs, this allows us to then say to the patient, hey, as you get your lifestyle under control, we can cut back. Just because you start a med doesn't mean you stay on it forever. So these are things we have to spend time teaching our patients. And then the biggest thing, again, we cannot wait. And we see this clinical inertia even more so in people that are 65 years and older. So again, that intensive treatment and staying on top of it is very, very critical. I've already talked about the benefits of combination therapy. And looking here at, you know, data from dapagliflozin and metformin in combination therapy, again, it's cost effective. We're fixing multiple organs here. We're getting like two and a half organs fixed with this particular combination. Add that to nutrition and, you know, improved activity, stress reduction. You can actually fix eight broken organs. And combination therapy with low hypo risk, weight loss potential, cardiovascular safety, it's a win-win across the board. You know, and again, the benefits of using first-line combination therapy is significant in reducing the overall burden of diabetes, not only to the patient, but to the payer, to the healthcare system. And again, with that, I'm going to actually let folks know, changes are coming. Combination therapy is something we're gonna see as a first-line therapy in the not-too-distant future. So what's the take-home message? We need to treat beyond glycemic control. There is no such thing as a person with just diabetes. So we have to look at that. You know, what is their A1C? But what is their blood pressure? What is their cholesterol? What is their cardiovascular risk? What about their kidneys? Are we, can we renally protect them? Inflammation, that's a whole nother lecture for a different time. But again, we need to look beyond, beyond that glycemic control. You know, how stupid is it to give a patient 
a medication and it causes weight gain when we want them to lose weight. I mean, come on, that is absolutely stupid. We need to set our patients up for success. The drug needs to help them. It can't fail them. Patients don't fail drugs. Drugs fail patients. And this is where, again, combination therapy, fixing all eight broken organs, you know, picking the right drug for the right patient, getting them the education that they need is how we can better manage diabetes. So, again, SGLT2 inhibitors not only lower A1C, they lower blood pressure, they have improved cardiovascular outcomes, improved renal outcomes, and they promote weight loss with a low hypo risk. So it's a win-win across the board for everyone. So I hope folks took something away today that they found valuable. You know, again, diabetes is an epidemic, and we need to start doing a little bit better job of caring for our people with diabetes. So with that, at this point, what I'd like to do is open it up for Q&A. So if you haven't already done so, go ahead and type your question into the box that's uh, located in the lower left side of, of the screen, and uh, let's, let's open it up for Q&A.